Lurigen have told us what went wrong with NS23. Boeing Starliner crew flight test has been delayed yet again. Relativity Space surpassed Max Q, and much more is coming up in this edition of Tomorrow Space News. We're saying goodbye to the aft end of booster rate, but at the same time, we're welcoming a brand new super heavy booster into the world. B10 has been stacked in high bay too, even though we can't see it. The orbital launch mount's various upgrades seem to have been progressing nicely as different stairs and scaffolding are being removed. Hopefully, this means that B7 will be returning soon, gearing up for the orbital flight test next month. New building alert, piles have been seen getting drilled into the ground. I'd love to say more, but that's pretty much all there is at the moment. Exactly a month ago, SpaceX launched their first batch of Starlink V2 mini satellites. Unlike their more experienced V1.5 siblings, they haven't been immediately raised up to their final orbit, with all 21 satellites staying around the same altitude that Falcon 9 delivered them to. Well, at least that was the case until a few days ago, as one of the satellites, designated 30062, has started falling back to Earth. Elon Musk has said on Twitter that SpaceX are experiencing some issues with the new V2 mini satellites, which is to be expected as they're brand new. They need testing, and to not add to the orbital debris problem, it's better to do that testing where the satellites will naturally re-enter over a short period if anything goes wrong. Elon also said that some satellites will be deorbited, so it looks like 30062 won't be the last. For comparison, this is what the altitudes of Starlink Group 54 are currently looking like, which launched a couple weeks before 6-1. Five satellites have deorbited, whereas the majority of the remainder has continued up. Looking back at 6-1, it's clear that this is a debugging phase. Kathy Luders, NASA's Associate Administrator for Space Operations, took to Twitter last week to announce that Boeing's first flight of Starliner with humans on board has been delayed yet again. Boeing CFT will now launch after Axiom 2 to allow for, quote, optimised station operations. It is true that with all of the different vehicles visiting and the limited number of docking ports available, it's becoming a logistical challenge to organise all of the different flights. But it also seems like Starliner is still awaiting some verification work. AX2 is currently scheduled for the 12th of May, with Commander Peggy Whitson, Pilot John Schofner, Mission Specialist Ali Alkani, and Mission Specialist Rayana Banawi, the former two from the United States, and the latter two from Saudi Arabia. This mission intends to spend 12 days on orbit, making it pretty clear that a Q2 2023 flight for Starliner is less likely. ULA's Vulcan is scheduled for launch eight days earlier on the May the 4th, so not accounting for any slips in testing, the CFT is flying after the debut flight of the latest methane-powered rocket. It's time to cast our minds back as six months ago on the 12th of September 2022 at 1427 Universal Time, Blue Origin's NS-23 suborbital flight departed Launch Site 1 at Corn Ranch in Texas. It was intended to be just another normal cargo science flight, carrying multiple payloads for different companies and universities. Come Max Q, however, this flight was entered into the history books. Blue Origin have identified the primary cause of the mission failure to be a structural fatigue failure of Tail 3's BE3PM engine, which itself was caused by the accepted temperatures being exceeded. In layman's terms, the engine melted. Tail 3 ended up crashing back into the ground as it had no engine to control itself. Fragments of the engine which were recovered have been examined and hot streaks are visible, which would lead to increasing temperatures, making the problem worse. The BE3 PM engine is going to be getting some design changes after this incident, such as modifying the combustion chamber and engine bell to reduce and cope with the temperatures in a much more non-destructive way. The capsule that flies atop New Shepard is designed to be able to cope with tail failures, and in NS23's case, it did perfectly. The capsule successfully returned to the ground and all of the payloads on board were recovered. These payloads are going to be flying on another flight in the near future. ITAR, the International Traffic in Arms Regulations, is often the butt of many jokes in the spaceflight community. However, for the United Arab Emirates deal with China, it's a lot more serious. We're heading back to last September again, as it was also the month when China and the UAE signed a memorandum of understanding for the latter's Rashid II lunar rover to fly on the former Chang'e 7 mission. According to the South China Morning Post, however, this deal has fallen through because of a breach of ITAR. There hasn't been any official confirmation from either party, however. 
China is currently working towards developing an International Lunar Research Station, or ILRS, in the next decade, and Chang'e 7 and its subsequent mission Chang'e 8 are intended to serve as demonstration missions for that master plan. If this report turns out to be true, then it could cause further friction down the road for international collaboration with China in aerospace. For just the Chang'e 7 mission though, it's freed up 10 kilos of extra mass that could be taken down to the lunar surface. Could another collaboration be found? Relativity became the first US manufacturer to launch a methane-powered rocket into space, but just before we get into that and the rest of space traffic, thank you to the Sisters of Tomorrow for your continued support of the show. Your contributions help to keep 204 operational, and in return you get access to space news scripts as they're being written, our post-show hangouts where we get up to loads of random stuff, and much more. If you fancy having your name on screen, head to the join button below and become a member for just 99 cents a month. If a free contribution is more your style, then there are plenty of ways you can help the channel grow. If you like what you see, leave a like, or just share the show around. Right then, let's get into traffic. The first orbital departure of the week was Tianmu 1, number 3, 4, 5 and 6, which are all meteorology research small sats from Xiyong Microelectronics Park. They were launched on this Kuaizhou 1A rocket from Site 95 at the Jiquan Satellite Launch Center in China. All four satellites were delivered to a sun-synchronous orbit. Next up is the launch you've all been waiting for, Relativity's first flight, good luck, have fun. They certainly had luck and we certainly had fun, so I think the primary mission objectives were fulfilled. On a more technical note, after a beautiful nighttime ascent out of Slick 16 at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida, the vehicle successfully passed through Max-Q, proving that a 3D printed rocket can bear the aerodynamic forces of an orbital launch. The first stage of the Terran 1 vehicle did its job flawlessly, delivering the second stage to an altitude of 70 km and a velocity of 7,448 km per hour. Unfortunately, however, this is the fastest that the vehicle would end up going on this flight, as the second stage failed to light its single Aeon Vac engine. Relativity wanted to get past Max Q, and they did. It's much further than several other aerospace companies have reached on their first flight, so Relativity can pat themselves on the back and be proud of what they've managed to achieve. Fingers crossed, their next flight will be the one that makes it to orbit, and they have a reliable track record from there. Next up was a military Soyuz 2.1A launching from Russia, carrying what is likely a Bars M reconnaissance satellite. Officially designated Cosmos 2567, this flight commenced at 0640 Coordinated Universal Time on Thursday from Site 433 at the Plazets Cosmodrome. The payload was delivered to a 338 by 499 km, 97.64 degree sun synchronous orbit, which is consistent with the orbit that the previous Bars M satellite was delivered to. If this payload is indeed a Bars M satellite, as we suspect, then it would be the fourth of the constellation. We're back in Mahia for the first time since last November as Rocket Lab was setting company records for the shortest time between two electron launches ever. Following their previous flight from Wallops on March 16th, the beat goes on, departed LC-1B at 0914 Universal Time on Friday the 24th. This flight also marked a switch in recovery methods as the helicopter catch could no longer be favoured, as I discussed in last week's episode, available in the corner of your screen now. Electron has been outfitted with better waterproofing to survive the ocean dip recovery method. Whilst the first stage was parachuting down to the Pacific Ocean, the second stage was delivering two small sats from Black Sky, weighing in at 56 kilos each. They were successfully delivered to their 450 km, 42 degree orbit. Oh, what a surprise, it's another Starlink mission. Specifically, it's Group 5 Mission 5, with another batch of V1.5 satellites delivered to the Gen 2 constellation. The flight commenced at 1543 UTC, also on Friday, from Space Launch Complex 40 at the Cape. The booster supporting this flight, B-1067, landed for the 10th time in its career on the drone ship a short fall of Gravitas, becoming the 7th booster to do so. It seemed a bit shaky after the bankruptcy in 2020, but finally OneWeb have finished off their initial constellation with this flight of the GSLV Mark III on Sunday, except it's not called that anymore, with the ISO Romy naming this rocket to the LVM-3, dropping the geostationary from geostationary launch vehicle. Naming aside, OneWeb 18 commenced at 0330 UTC on Sunday from Launch Pad 2 at the Satish Devan Space Centre. The satellites on board were delivered to their 1,200km, 86.4 degree circular orbit. 
even though this is the end of the constellation, it isn't the end of OneWeb flights. In May, we'll be seeing OneWeb 19 launch on a Falcon 9, carrying a second gen demo satellite, 15 spare gen 1 satellites, and 5 Iridium Next satellites. The upcoming departures for this week start halfway through the week, as Wednesday we'll see the inaugural flight of Space Pioneer's Tianglong 2 from Zhiquan. Wednesday we'll also see EO MKA4 launching on the boosterless Soyuz 2.1V from Plesetsk. And to add another launch into the mix, Wednesday we'll also see Starlink Group 5 Mission 10 launching on a Falcon 9 from the Cape. An unknown payload will fly on a Long March 2D on Thursday. Another Falcon 9 flight is scheduled for Thursday. It's an RTLS from Vandy. China's back to launching on Friday with a Long March 4C. And iSpace is launching their Hyperbola 1 from Xiuquan on Sunday. There's also a Kuaizhou 1A, which is currently net March with no specific date or time. There's much more to watch on tomorrow as the space weather woman Dr. Tamitha Scove will be back with an update on Wednesday. There's our weekly live show on Friday and I'm back next week with more news. Just a quick note before we wrap up, if you're still watching this part of the video, you probably like what we do here at Tomorrow. So if you're interested in joining the team, either presenting or editing or writing anything to help with the production of tomorrow space news that would be greatly appreciated jamie put out a tweet earlier this week so just go look at that tweet head over to the discord everything should be linked down below how to get in contact so yeah if you're interested in joining that's an opportunity that is currently on the table but for now thanks for watching and goodbye